this week on Forward. But as with everything Musk, it's not simple. He's somewhat mercurial. And there's no one simple answer where I can say, is he a Democrat, Republican, left, right? I think you have to read the evolution that happens over the past three years. A very closely associated quote is, technology does not automatically progress, which is what a lot of people think. Technology does not, <laughs> people think, oh, technology is going to get better. And his point is technology does not automatically progress. It requires human agency. And that's easier for Elon to see and think because he's literally the agent. Musk is not doing his rockets as a billionaire boy's toy. He's not flying up in the rockets himself. He's actually transforming uh, our ability uh, to get into space. It is my distinct privilege and pleasure to welcome the biographer to the great geniuses of our time and the author of the recent authoritative biography on Elon Musk, aptly called Elon Musk, Walter Isaacson. Welcome, Walter. Good to talk to you again, Andrew. Good to talk to you as well. Holy crap, man. I feel like I've just found out what you've been doing for the last two years. <laughs> what was your reaction when you first realized, I guess I'm going to follow Elon Musk around for two years? <laughs> you know, I was talking to him because I'd done a book, as you know, on Steve Jobs and bringing us to the digital revolution. Then one on Jennifer Doudna, who brought us with the co-invention of CRISPR, the gene editing technology, into the life sciences revolution. I was looking forward to the next sort of big earth shattering things. And to me, Elon Musk was doing space travel and he was bringing us into the era of electric vehicles. And so I talked to him on the phone. We talked for about an hour and a half at one point. And I said to him, if I'm going to do a book, I don't want to do it based on five or 10 or even 15 interviews. I want to be by your side all meetings, all day, morning, noon, and night, for a couple of years, any week I choose to be out with you. He said, okay. And then I said, and the other thing is, I don't want you to have any control over this book. I'm not going to show it to you in advance. You don't get to read it before it's published. He went, okay. And I went down, I was telling my wife and friends that, okay, you know, I'm thinking of doing this. And all of a sudden, they're starting to buzz. And I said, what happened? He said, well, he just tweeted out, Walter's writing my biography. So, well, I guess that's how I knew I was on the roller coaster. Wow. Uh, well, I thought it was a masterwork. I learned a lot, but I also actually feel like I grew somehow. I was talking to my wife about it uh, all week. Uh, what has the reaction been? And I, I will say, I think there's a lot of hostility towards Elon among certain sorts of people. Um, I thought your book was very fair, very objective. It felt like you were uh, a fly on the wall or just at, like recording events in many cases. Um, but what has the, the reaction been over the last number of days? Well, I think it's, yeah, I love uh, the reactions to the book. As you say, he's so controversial. There's some people who just hate him and, you know, think, okay, how can you write a book about him? And others who think he's like a canonize him and think that he can do no wrong uh, and in general, uh, sometimes people criticize, well, you didn't slam him hard enough or be too judgmental. I think you read the stories, you can make your own judgments, but there's clear that times when he's in his dark moods and when he does political things or things he's doing with the platform that used to be known as Twitter, uh, I'm pretty honest and don't sugarcoat it. And I tell the story pretty strong. But as you say, I want you to have a feeling reading this book that it's fast-paced narrative storytelling, that you're right up close to him and watching him as it's happened. So I'm gonna, I like the fact that other people have really strong judgments. In our day and age, I think we get too fast to um, canonize or demonize somebody. You know, our cable TV and talk radios are kind of made for people with really strong opinions. But every now and then, I think you've got to get a complicated story. Uh, and certainly, Elon Musk is the most interesting story you could possibly know right now. Yeah, he seemed very three-dimensional. Uh, and I, I do think a lot of journalists, frankly, if they were given that kind of access, would have, quote-unquote, slammed him. <laughs> and I, I thought that you were really, really straight up and objective. One of the major themes of the book 
was that Elon might be wired a little bit differently uh, that, than other, yeah. uh, other folks. Uh, Grimes uh, talked about, look, I, I think that he might not feel empathy in the same way that others uh, he self-describes as having Asperger's. SNL makes the same point uh, where they gave him the line that you quoted saying, hey, I uh, revolutionized uh, space travel and mainstream electric vehicles, so maybe I'm not a chill dude. Um, like the, the, the rest of you. Uh, and one of the major themes of the book is maybe it takes someone with a different type of brain wiring to do some of the things that he's done. Um, I, I will say on a personal level, I have a child who's neurodivergent. Uh, and so he is very, very unmindful of various social norms and says things that are frankly wholly inappropriate. Um, now he's 10, so no one cares, <laughs> but, but, but if you could fast forward to some point in the future, it's possible that, uh, you know, he, he might continue to be unmindful in a particular way. I want, I want to pick up on this before we move on. Please, this, no, is please most, do. this is one of the most interesting reactions to my book. You've done it. I can tell you 20 or 30 other people have done it, but I haven't talked about it enough publicly. People with neurodivergent kids, as you say who are on the autism spectrum, and certainly I have a, you know, people in my family who are that way, they have reacted to this book in a very deep way because, indeed, Musk says that he has Asperger's, you know, the common phrase sometimes used for the autism spectrum, uh, and he really is not wired for understanding human emotions well. He talks about having to train himself to understand emotions. And there's, I won't say the name, but a TV host you would know quite well as a son like that. And he says the only way to make it work, and I'm like thinking of you and your 10-year-old, is that this person said, my son's like Elon. He just doesn't get the emotional cues, says things that are, as you put it, wholly inappropriate at times. But I sit with him. We go to the baseball game together. I put my arm around him. And when he does, I say, when the guy gives you the popcorn, look him in the eye and say thank you. Or if somebody asks you a question, try to understand what they want to hear and try to please them. And he says, I do it day in and day out, and it helps him some, but I know he's always going to be different. Musk grew up this way with a father who told him he was stupid, who told him he was useless, who whenever Musk got beaten up on the playground, which is what happens when you're neurodivergent or you're socially awkward, he'd get his face pummeled. And then he'd have to stand in front of his father who would take the side of the person who beat him up. And so this doesn't excuse, Elon. I'm trying to tell you the narrative. And people say where you're trying to justify his way. I'm saying, no, no, no. I'm trying to explain to you who he is. And yeah, he shouldn't do things that are totally inappropriate. But I tell you, I've been surprised by the quiet, meaningful feedback I have with people who have people in their families who say things, as you put it, who are inappropriate for the moment or aren't catching the social cues. And for Elon's case... It's pretty bad. He has a son, too, Saxon, delightful kid in the book, very wise. He always quotes Saxon. But Saxon is autistic and always has to have a minder or somebody with him. And uh, it's weird in this day and age when you do a narrative like this, you're on the borderline of explaining but not necessarily excusing the inappropriate behavior. But I do think I try to let the reader Go deep the way you just did, Andrew. Imagine running for president and wanting to share what you experienced in a way that's entertaining, edifying, and maybe even a little bit scary. That's The Last Election, out in bookstores now, a novel about an independent presidential candidate, a journalist with a massive story, and what the heck could be our next slash last election. Check it out at andrewyang.com. Well, I think you did a really effective job, and certainly having... Uh, a son who's autistic uh, gave me a different perspective. 
Um, one of the, the major themes I thought uh, that the book delved into, there, there is this point in the book when um, Elon sues the government or sues NASA over awarding contracts uh, in an incentives plus structure, uh, which is, hey, Lockheed Martin or Boeing, uh, take on this project, and then you can add 20% as a profit margin, regardless of whether it is successful or not. And then Elon actually sues and says, hey, that's not the way you can award contracts, which anyone advising him would say that's insane to sue the U.S. government. Uh, and somehow he wins. And then when the contracts are then dealt out based upon who can perform a task, they end up, or uh, SpaceX ends up getting the contracts and then leapfrogging uh, the other players. Um, th there's a, a consistent theme about Elon kind of flouting rules, breaking rules, pushing the, the boundaries in some ways that, again, people would find totally inadvisable <laughs> in a lot of contexts. Um, but that particular... Uh, incentive switch ends up being literally the key to SpaceX's success. But in the key to America's success in getting astronauts back into orbit. You know, 50 years ago, we sent people to the moon, and then we gave up. We didn't go back. 12 or so years ago, we grounded the space shuttle, and since then haven't been able to get astronauts from the U.S. to the space station. Uh, and what you put your finger on, once again, you put your finger on some other interviewers have not yet s talked about, which is, it seems minor, but it's huge, which is not only has he built rockets that can send mass and astronauts into orbit and can land and be reused, which no country or company has done, have reusable rockets, but he moved us from cost plus contracting, which you described, which is... Take all the time you want, and whatever it costs you, we'll give you that plus a profit. This is why Boeing became flabby. This is why NASA was not able to get astronauts into orbit. And he said, no, give me a mission, tell me a fixed price, and then in the book you see him walking through the assembly line day after day saying, how do we make this valve a little bit less expensive, or this part of the nose cone a little bit lighter. And he ends up being able to accomplish the missions at one-tenth the cost of a Boeing yep. or Lockheed. And Boeing, and Musk and Boeing had both gotten, after this, contracts to get astronauts to the space station around the same time. Musk has had like 33 missions now, sending things into orbit and multiple missions to the space station, Boeing and NASA have yet to be able to do a successful test flight that gets astronauts up. So moving us into the era of fixed fee-for-service rather than cost-plus contracting, it sounds like something only a geek like me and you could appreciate, but it's part of the big deal. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I understood the, that if you change the incentives, you actually have a real chance um, and there are, unfortunately, a lot of other areas in American life where I think the incentives um, are, are messed up. I'm going to randomly share a story because Richard Branson makes a cameo um, in, in your book. I, I was with Richard last year, and he talked about his maiden flight into space, uh, and he talked about how the rocket doesn't have a bathroom, um, so he wore a diaper uh, uh, on the maiden flight, um, but he didn't want wearing the diaper on the first trip to be his only time using the diaper. So he put the diaper on the day before <laughs> and, 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 and just tried it out to see if it worked. Um, so he, he was sharing the kind of uh, detail about, you know, some of the less glamorous elements um, uh, of uh, space travel. There's this tension between the public sector and billionaires now uh, in American life. Uh, you used to be the head of Time magazine. By the way, I had a friend who worked for you during that time, and, and people thought very well of you. Now Time is owned by uh, Mark Benioff, who I believe is a billionaire. Billionaires own a lot of the major media companies. Elon's obviously a billionaire. Um, and it, it seems like there are these gaps in what the public sector can and can't do, and so people are turning to billionaires, but then they hate turning to billionaires because there's a real problem with the, this notion that you need a billion dollars to get anything done in American life. Uh, 
I feel like this is one of the things that your book touches on in various ways, <laughs> is that there's something garish, obviously, about uh, commercial space travel being a billionaire uh, sandbox. Um, but then if we waited for the public sector to do it, we might be waiting forever. Well, let's uh, make clear that even though Elon Musk went and was with Branson when Branson took his flight, Musk is not doing his rockets as a billionaire boy's toy. He's not flying up in the rockets himself. He's the only person who can get our U.S. intelligence satellites into high Earth orbit, the only person who's been able to uh, you know, send up almost 5,000 satellites to recreate the Internet in outer space. And if you look this year alone, I think he will launch maybe 1,600 tons of payload and satellites into orbit. That's more than every other country, meaning China, Russia, the United States, and every other company combined. Not only that, it's four times as much as every other company and country combined. So it's not just a billionaire's boy toy here. He's actually transforming uh, our ability uh, to get into space. This podcast is sponsored by Helix Sleep. It's a pretty short list of things you can do that are going to make you happier, healthier, more energetic, more productive every single day. You know what's on that list? Getting the right freaking mattress. And what's the right mattress for you? If you go to Helix Sleep, you take their personalized sleep quiz and they will send you one of 20 unique mattresses made for you and you alone. Well, not you and you alone, like 5% of people. Do the math. For a 100 night free trial, you can sleep on this thing for three months. It will keep you cool. Don't just take my word for it. My kids seek out this mattress in the house. It's the number one rated mattress picked by GQ and Wired Magazine. This mattress will actually make you happier, healthier, and more productive. Helix is offering 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners. Go to helixsleep.com slash yang. This is their best offer yet, and it won't last long. With Helix, better sleep starts now. So I will say, people probably know this, but Elon uh, did endorse me during my presidential run last time. I think his exact quote was, I like Yang, which I appreciated. I did meet him and Grimes. Um, I'm a huge Grimes fan. Uh, I thought that she was a lovely human. <laughs> and, uh, and, oh, yes. and we, Yeah, and, and uh, uh, she actually has preceded you uh, on this podcast. Um, so I, I feel like you were witness to a lot of um, uh, family uh, events. Um, now the perception of Elon seems to have been um, transformed by his recent takeover of Twitter, now X. Um, and when I, I talked to my wife about Elon buying Twitter, um, I had a very, very bad feeling. Um, and and I, I'll explain my bad feeling like this. Um, I've got 1.6 million followers on Twitter. Um, Elon has about a hundred times as many. <laughs> he has like 159 um, million uh, followers. And my wife feels bad for me that I'm on Twitter. And I'm imagining like an alternate world where Elon uh, not only didn't buy X, but just wasn't on X at all. Um, I, I have a feeling that uh, we'd be in a very, we'd be thinking of him very differently um, if he was never on X. A hundred percent. I think that's totally true. And I think it's a shame that he both bought X. He has a friend um, named Antonio, close friend, and they were traveling once. And Musk, just in the middle of the night, maybe with a little bit too much Red Bull or Ambien, uh, was always tweeting out these things, which, you know, doesn't help his reputation amongst a lot of people. And the friend put the uh, phone, his phone in the safe in the hotel room and put in a code so Elon couldn't get it late at night. Elon called hotel security at three in the morning and made him open the safe. He's addicted to sending out tweets. My book, I try not to go down the rabbit hole too much of Twitter. It was, I think, is not a great um, move for him. He doesn't have the emotional receptors that might create the type of happy environment you'd want for advertisers. And as Kimball, his brother, says, You know, Twitter will just be a pimple on his reputation. I think people have to understand uh, Twitter, 
But they have to understand all the other things he does, especially the move into artificial intelligence, which will truly transform our lives, and Optimus the robot, which will be able to see and hear and be able to navigate in the world. And getting back to you, Andrew, one of the reasons he supported you is he thinks artificial general intelligence and what he's doing with Optimus the robot will transform work so much that he's in favor of a universal basic income, even though he has nowadays what I would call more populist uh, sentiments on the right. He still believes that we do need to transform work uh, by having not only artificial intelligence, but robotics and self-driving cars and self-driving trucks, and that we should take the proceeds from that and have at least some form of uh, universal basic income. Yeah, he he has spoken about that um, both uh, during my campaign and and since then, uh, and we share a lot of the concerns um, about uh, AI. So uh, you can tell I kind of wish he wasn't on <laughs> Twitter. Uh, Just you know, like your or, wife or, feels or, bad about you. <laughs> oh yeah, my my wife feels bad for me, and I I, I appreciate. Uh, that 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 about her. So Elon very controversially uh, cut seventy five percent of uh, the employees of Twitter, and then there were a lot of folks who said, "Hey, that's going to be too deep to the bone. They're going to have it's going to collapse." Uh, was the critique? Um, it had some problems, but it has not collapsed, um, and it ended up spurring a mega trend among tech companies actually cutting staff. I don't know if you were aware of that. You probably are. <laughs> that other boards and investors said, hey, guys, like, look over there. They just cut 75%. So you should at least be able to cut 30%. So I, I feel like that was a move that only Elon would have made. But it, it does have profound repercussions in my mind. One of the things that, beyond tech, because one of the things that I've been saying to folks is, look, if you move to remote work, um, you're moving a lot of workers more towards being automated and becoming um, irrelevant in their orgs. Like when we were all in the same place, like when you were running time, everyone came together and you chewed over ideas uh, and and uh, um, it sometimes had a real impact on the stories. But now if you move everyone to remote, then it ends up being easier to cut a disembodied avatar than it is a human that you literally see every day. Do you think that... Um, that uh, Elon's personnel moves will end up um, causing a trend that extends beyond tech? Well, he was right that you could cut 75, 80 percent of the people at Twitter. And he has a philosophy, which is all in hardcore, if you're going to work here, uh, a fierce sense of urgency is our operating uh, principle. And there are other workplaces that do it differently. I can remember Time Magazine in the old days where, you know, we took Mondays and Tuesdays off and had a drinks cart coming down on closing night. Uh, And I think people have to choose. Do I want to be in a hardcore environment where, you know, hackathon and sometimes staying up all night? Do I want a more pleasant work-life balance? And I think in America it's really good that we have both opportunities, two types of places. He turned Twitter, the company, from being one of the most nurturing, sweet places to being a hardcore, all-in, intense place. There's a whole chapter called All In in the book. And uh, you can like that or you can hate that, but we have to understand that those are the choices not only employers make, but those of us who are employees get to sometimes choose what type of place we'd prefer to work. The more complicated issue which you've wrestled with is when you make a company uh, have a reduced workforce and they're more efficient. They can still get it done with, you know, 20% of the workers, 30% of the workers. When you do that across the board and the companies are doing that, does that actually reduce the total amount of employment in a society? Or in some ways, does it increase productivity and you end up overall disrupting some jobs but having more employment in a society. And I think there's a too simplistic of a view, which is if companies lay people off, they'll end up increasing the total amount of unemployment. Uh, The data points don't really show that. I mean, if automation and robotics were 
decreasing the total number of jobs, unemployment would be real high now because we have a lot of that. So productivity at a place like Twitter or at a place, any other place you want to name, may be the best way to keep employment up, but we also have to be sensitive to both the needs, the desires, and really the spiritual well-being of people who work at places. Um, sounds like time was a great place to work when you were there, Walter. <laughs> yeah, no, the drinks card every Thursday and Friday night. Yeah, people are hearing that description and are like, oh man, uh, sign, sign me up for that. Hey, YouTube, glad you're enjoying the podcast. If you really like it, hit subscribe, and then YouTube will notify you every time we have a bang up new guest. Thank you. So I'm around young people a lot, and there's like a very, very real emphasis culturally in young people of community, taking care of each other, kindness, uh, um, uh, that kind of collegiality. And then I, I think one of the reasons why Elon encounters a lot of hostility is that his stuff seems to fly in the face of that in many ways. It, it, it's very much mission, uh, hardcore, as you, you, you describe it. Um, there are times when he's blatantly unfair to some of his reports, and you have painstaking accounts of, of some of those. Uh, the person who ran Solar City, um, which is put in, in what sounded like an impossible position, um, he pretty much names an engineer as being at fault when it's not the engineer's fault. It turns out that it was the humidity, uh, the, the launch site that ended up um, causing the issue. But there's obviously no shortage of people that want to work for Elon because he's got an incredible mission set and, and track record, but also he's created so much value that if you become part of these organizations, there's a chance that you get very, very uh, rich um, pretty quickly. So in a way, he can afford to be himself, uh, I guess, more mission-oriented and hardcore and brusque because then that there is no shortage uh, of people. Um, do you feel like those two things, and this is one of the themes of the book, is that, uh, and there are people, by the way, that work for Elon that then say, hey, like, I can't work for Elon because this is totally not the way I, I do things. Um, they probably would have been quite happy at Time Magazine under your tenure. <laughs> um, do, do you think that there is like a, a tension between some of the emphasis on uh, collegiality and manners versus this hardcore mission orientation? Yeah, I think so. And Musk talks about it in the book. I, I'm a real believer in collegiality. And I think I, if you knew people who work with me at time, you say they enjoyed it because I tried to make it enjoyable. And collegiality is a good thing. And certainly being empathetic to your employees is a good thing. But as Steve Jobs said to me and then Elon Musk said to me, because they were both more hardcore all in, he said, sometimes being nice ends up being self-indulgent in a leader, meaning they care too much about what the two or three people in front of them are feeling, and they want everybody to like them, and they lose sight of the hardcore mentality you have to have in order to achieve the mission. And so by being nice to a few people around you or who happens to walk into your office, you're making yourself feel good. It's being self-indulgent to you and not just the person in front of you. But maybe there are thousands of people who aren't going to do as, you know, things are not going to go as well because you've lost sight of the mission. You're just trying to please everybody. In my own personal example, I think I was pretty good at running Time magazine. It was a very flush period. We were making a lot of money. I knew everybody on the staff. I didn't have to be disruptive. As you may recall, I then moved to CNN. And I sat there caring about every, you know, being, making sure that, you know, Lou Dobbs and Greta Van Susteren and, uh, and everybody was feeling good. And probably I should have been more of a disruptor. I should have had more of the mission in mind and been tougher as a boss. In fact, I ended up being pushed that way after the war, the Gulf War. It's like, OK, now you got to make cuts. Now you got to be tougher. And I said, you know what? That's not me. And I left CNN, went to the Aspen Institute. You got to look inside yourself but you also have to realize 
that from the perspective of a Steve Jobs or an Elon Musk or a Bill Gates in the early days of Microsoft or a Jeff Bezos, that being self-indulgent in terms of wanting and being needy enough to want everybody to love you, that's a good thing up to a point, but not if you lose sight of the hardcore way you need to pursue the mission in order for the enterprise to succeed and survive. Yeah, reading this book made me reflect on my own nature, uh, Walter. I uh, imagine myself to be a fairly uh, collegial human. (laughs) At the same time, um, when I was running for president, uh, I put my all into it um, and was... um, Hardcore in some ways. I mean, I don't think I ever um, was unduly, you know, a jerk uh, to those around me because I was trapped in a rental vehicle with them. And I discovered pretty quickly that if I was a jerk to them, it just ruined the whole day (laughs) because they're still in the rental vehicle. But it, it it made me even dwell on my own balance a lot. You know, like, do I, uh, have there been times when, um, maybe I should have been more hardcore and mission oriented. Like, uh, you know, like that, that, that's the kind of impact the book had on me. Yeah. I mean, and I, as I said, I think I felt that way a little bit uh, coming out of CNN, which is I had to figure out who I am. And I'm not as hard. I mean, I've talked to a lot of people who've worked for Musk, and they said, I was all in and hardcore, especially in my 20s and 30s. But now I want a work-life balance, and I'm moving on. But I was out in Los Angeles about four or five days ago, and uh, there's a person in my book uh, from the launch site down in southern Texas. And Musk just goes ballistic on him one late Friday night because only a few people are working at the launch pad. And Musk says, we got to be all in. We gotta be, we'll never get to Mars unless we have an all-in intensity. And he orders up a surge, and people... And this guy learns how to survive it, understands how to deal with Musk, ends up getting promoted, even though he gets reamed out. But then when he's having a kid, he says, all right, you know, I'm no longer all in. I'm no longer hardcore. I admired that. And then in Los Angeles, he's walking up to me after some event, said, hey, how are you? What you doing? He says, I'm missing it. I got to get back. I got to get back to SpaceX because... I had a choice of being burned out or being bored. I think I'd rather be burned out in pursuit of the mission. So we all have different values at different times in our lives. This podcast is sponsored by ExpressVPN. Going online without ExpressVPN is like changing while leaving your window wide open. Gross! You might not have anything to hide, but why give random creeps a chance to invade your privacy. That's why I use ExpressVPN. It's super easy, you hit a button and then you just beam in. Best of all, you know no one can see what you're doing. No big tech companies, no ad companies, no other companies. Why use ExpressVPN? When you go online, it is just you and you're surfing, no one can see it. You know it's the way to go because a bunch of big companies say, hey, All of you high-end consultants and spies use ExpressVPN. Secure your online activity by visiting expressvpn.com slash yang today. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S V-P-N dot com slash yang and you can get an extra three months free. Expressvpn.com slash yang. So uh, a number of years ago, people would think of Elon as kind of uh, green, a little bit left of center. He was an Obama supporter. Um, And and then over the last number of years, I think some people think of him as actually kind of conservative, uh, reactionary. Um, I have a sense that part of that is because he's been attacked by certain people. And there's a natural tendency that if you get attacked by a certain group of people, then you say, okay, like, I guess uh, whoever doesn't like you, I guess I'm with them. And I, I, I personally, uh, you know, see that as a problem of polarization, um, that there is this uh, us versus them, left versus right dynamic. Um, I, I've been, uh, frankly, I've, I think I've been attacked by both sides. <laughs> but, um, but what is your perception as to, 
um, whether uh, Elon uh, actually belongs at that conventional left-right dynamic, whether he's uh, somewhat uh, independent uh, or uh, just uh, you know intellectually not really um, ideological or easily categorized. Yeah, he's hard to characterize. You're right. And in the book, you'll see it in the narrative, the slow evolution of him being what I would call almost a traditional center left, you know, supporter of Obama, supporter of Democrats. And he moves to a position that's hard to put a label on, but it's basically, I wouldn't say conservative, it's kind of populist, right, pugnacious, uh, and sometimes, you know, believing in things I would call conspiracy theories. Uh, he doesn't spout them too much, but he lets them back on the platform that used to be known as Twitter, and he'll retweet people or like or say interesting or wow. And so there's part of him that has moved to that area. Partly it's a reaction to Democrats just attacking him all the time and Elizabeth Warren saying, you know, he doesn't pay taxes or what way should when he, in fact, that year paid more tax than any other human has ever paid to any entity in history. Uh, and it's partly a personal thing in the book, which he felt that his daughter became so infected by what he called the woke mind virus that she hated billionaires and hated capitalism and changed her last name and wouldn't speak to him. And it's partly a reaction to, I think, what he felt was too onerous of shutdowns uh, during COVID. So the evolution in the book, you see it happen. But as with everything Musk, it's not simple. He's somewhat mercurial. I can speak to him in the middle of the day sometimes when I was writing this book, and he talked about the need for moderates and having a centrist party, having a PAC supporting people in the center. And then sometimes he'd be on just a, you know, a jag about woke, wokeness or something. So as with everything he does, he's variable. Uh, I do think uh, it's a reason a lot of people don't like him is this political evolution. Had he not spoken about politics, had he not tweeted things, had he not bought Twitter, had he not gone down to the southern border and shown videos of people trying to get across the Rio Grande, I think he would be a lot, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't be a lightning rod, wouldn't have so many people. But it's part of who he is, is he gets worked up about things. And there's no one simple answer where I can say, is he a Democrat, Republican, left, right? I think you have to read the evolution that happens over the past three years. No, that, it's fascinating. I think a lot of the response now and the, the way I see politics is there's like this um, anti-institutional energy that takes various forms. And I feel like Elon has been attacked by various institutions. And so he, he has come across as kind of anti-institutional. Um, right, he hates the mainstream media. And he thinks that he's always been attacked in the great old institutions. And I do remind him that I think I may be the poster boy for the old line, old fashioned establishment media, having spent my time at Time Magazine and uh, CNN. But CNN. he laughs about that. Yeah. Well, he, he gave you a personal exemption, Walter. <laughs> you I don't got know. The I just sit there in the corner. I'm letting everybody go for the ride. Everybody gets to, I think he's fascinating as well as controversial. And I think it's useful to just watch him and form your own judgments. You know, when I come out of Louisiana, they're either preachers or storytellers. And I had a mentor tell me, for heaven's sake, be a storyteller. This world's got too many preachers. So some of the, the big quotes toward the tail end of the book are from Elon. I think that they really summarize some of the things you and I are, are talking about. Um, I'm sure you've heard this over and over again from folks uh, um, who've interviewed in the book. Um, but Elon says, this is how civilizations decline. They quit taking risks. And when they quit taking risks, their arteries harden. Every year there are more referees and fewer doers. When you've had success for too long, you lose the desire to take risks. Uh, and then a, a very closely associated quote is, 
technology does not automatically progress, which is what a lot of people think. Technology does not, <laughs> people think, oh, technology is going to get better. And his point is technology does not automatically progress. Um, uh, it requires human agency. And that's easier for Elon to see and think because he's literally the agent. Um, but I, I think that there's a, a very, very important observation there that this stuff is not automatic. Yeah, you know, we got to the moon 50 years ago. And then we quit going to the moon and quit going anywhere else. We had a space shuttle that used to take astronauts into orbit. And it was risky. It actually, as you know, it was risky. It exploded. But then we quit doing it. And now NASA has no way to get astronauts to the space station, which is why SpaceX has to do it. We're a nation, Andrew, of people with risk-taking ingrained into their character. Whether you came over on the Mayflower, or you came from Europe escaping oppression, or from Venezuela, or you came across the Rio Grande, people took risks. And now I think Musk is right. Why are we not taking great adventures? Why are we so paralyzed, whether it be with the clown show in Congress or our inability to manufacture things in America that well? I think that Elon Musk takes a few too many risks. I think he needs a few more guardrails. But I think he's right that we've become sclerotic. Our arteries have hardened as a nation because there are more people making rules and regulations than innovating. There are more referees and uh, regulators, more lawyers, more people saying, I, you can't do that, or it'd probably be a good idea not to do that. And he has a five-step algorithm, whether he's making a rocket or making a car, which is step one, question every rule, question every regulation. There's no rule that's unbreakable other than the laws of physics. And then, you know, it goes on that you simplify and you question everything. We got to be able to get back to that instead of saying, okay, we can design a few cool things and then we send them off to other countries to manufacture. That has messed up our economy and messed up our pride as a nation. And one of the things, I mean, we talked about Musk being good at changing us from cost plus contracts to risk contracts. I think the other thing that's important is he's moved manufacturing, whether it's batteries or cars or rocket ships, back to the United States and shows that we can actually do it. Well, I couldn't agree with you more, Walter. Here's to taking some more risks, innovating, being less sclerotic, maybe not Elon level risks, but, uh, you know, like a yeah. healthy amount of risk because at no, this point... No, we need a balance. You're right. And the book shows... And by the way, we need regulators. I'm glad there's a Highway Transportation Safety Board looking into things because he would be out of control without guardrails. But we also don't need more people making... Too many more people who make guardrails than we have making innovations. Well, I did go to law school, and then I, I left the practice after five months because I, I didn't want to be negative throughout my entire 20s. <laughs> well, let's not knock the lawyers. I mean, Shakespeare can do that, but we can. Uh, I want lawyers to enjoy this book, too. Well, everyone should read this book because I, I think that they'll um, actually learn about the human condition uh, and also about what it may take to improve uh, our circumstances uh, as a species. Walter, congratulations on an awesome achievement. Elon Musk, you certainly don't need my plug because I think it's literally like one of the best-selling books of all time already. Um, but it's an accomplishment to be proud of, um, and I hope you get a little bit of a break. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm having a good old time. I'm back home in New Orleans, and thank you so much for what you said about the book, Andrew. Andrew. 